In this week's block of scripture includes three books of the Old Testament, the book of Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. These will all be done in separate presentations, and so this presentation we will first look at the book of Nehemiah, the prophet Nehemiah. As always, read the book before listening or watching the presentation. I think you'll get more out of it. By way of introduction, let's take a look at Nehemiah. The word burden, which is used to render the word Massah, may be taken to mean both a lifting up of the voice, utterance, oracle, and a heavy lot or fate. The prophet uses Massah to describe the prophetic message or oracles revealed against a people. In this case, the prophecy was against Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. So that's why it talks about this being the burden against Nineveh, or the burden of Nineveh. Jonah fled from the Lord because he did not want to call Nineveh to repentance. But when he finally accepted the Lord's call, Nineveh repented and was saved. By Nehemiah's time, however, Nineveh had again become extremely wicked. Therefore, Nahum pronounced the Lord's burden upon the city. Like Judah, Nineveh had repented once and was saved, but then forgot the lessons and slid back into wickedness. Now she would have to take the consequences. The date of Nahum's activities has to be deduced from certain statements made in the prophecy. In chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, reference is made to the destruction of the city of Naaman, the Egyptian Thebes, as an already accomplished fact. We know Thebes was captured by Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian, in 663 B.C. Therefore, Nahum's prophecy must have been written before that date. And since Nahum's prophecy detail deals with the coming destruction of Nineveh, we know it must have been written before 612 B.C., the date of her downfall. We may date Nahum's ministry with some degree of probability, therefore, between the years 663 B.C. and 612 B.C. So, let's begin. Nahum, chapters 1, verses 1 through 14. The prophecies of Nahum were written in superb Hebrew poetry. Nahum was a poet. When he saw in vision the end of Assyria, he poured forth an unrestrained and picturesque Hebrew the relief felt by his people. In many ways, his poetry vents the wrath, sighs, and relief, and bespeaks the hope of all who have been oppressed when the oppressors at least have ceased and the oppressor is no more. But Nahum was also a prophet, and he saw in Assyrian's downfall an example of the hand of God in justice, reaping with a vengeance all the enemies of good, while he preserves in mercy and with patience those who try to do good. Envisioning the overthrow of this cruel, mighty empire, whose kings in their own record boast of the captives they have maimed, the realms they have subjected, and the treasures they have confiscated, Nahum tells how the doom of the mighty and wicked is decreed, deserved, and done. His book begins with an acrostic, with one strophe or stanza for each of the first 15 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, with two alliterations of the sequence. The, surf, the first seven strophes, verses 2 through 5, emphasize God's power over nature and over his enemies, but the third, verses three, verse 3a, three, interrupts to tell of his goodness and justice. The second seven strophes emphasizes his power over all the enemies and evils, but again tells by contrast in the third of the series, verse 7, of his goodness and his mercy to those who take refuge in him. The fifteenth and final strophe, verse 10, provides a summary and a transition to the next subject to be treated, the castigation of Nineveh. Assyria and Judah are alternately addressed in the next poem, verses 11 through 14. The one is to be punished and the other is to be redeemed. 
it concludes with the hopeful verse speaking of a peaceful age in terms that seem to herald the messianic age when all oppressors shall have ceased. George L. Robinson, a Bible scholar, speaks of Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian king who destroyed no Ammon or Thebes, and the brutality of the Assyrians in these words. Ashurbanipal was exceptionally cruel. He even boasts of his violence and shameful atrocities, how he ruthlessly tore off the lips and limbs of the kings, forced three captured rulers of Elam to drag his chariots through the streets, compelled a prince to wear around his neck the decapitated head of his king, and how he and his queen feasted in a garden with the head of a Chaldean monarch who he had forced to commit suicide hanging from a tree above them. No other king, even of Assyria, ever boasted of such inhumane and atrocious barbarities. As he advanced towards Egypt on one of his expeditions, twenty-two kings are said to have paid him homage. Upon his arrival, both Memphis, the capital of Lower Egypt, and Thebes, the capital of Upper Egypt, were successfully wrested from Turaka and cruelly punished. The poor people of Judah and Jerusalem were spectators of all these horrors. Indeed, they had beheld for generations an almost endless succession of the Syrian invasions of Palestine. And now, Ashurbanipal, the worst seemed yet to come. Nahum and his compatriots in Jerusalem apparently lay bound and helpless in the grasp of a cruel, tyrannical enemy. So that gives you an idea of the cruelty of the Assyrians, especially in war, and how brutal they were. Nahum, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, God's attributes of justice and mercy. You need to understand and remember that God is both just and merciful. Mercy cannot rob justice. They both have to be in play. They are both attributes of God. The prophecy opens with a sublime description of the attributes and works of God. This is provided for the purpose of inspiring the Jews to have confidence in him as their protector. Stated in words of Dr. E. Henderson, an English scholar of nearly a century ago, Nothing can exceed in grandeur and sublimity the description which the prophet furnishes of the divine character. The attributes of infinite purity, inflexible rectitude, irresistible power, and boundless goodness set forth and illustrated by images borrowed from the history of the Hebrews, the scene of Palestine, and more astonishing phenomena of nature present to view a God worthy of the profoundest reverence and most unbound confidence and most intensive, intense love. The Lord is shown to be a God of both vengeance and mercy. The two aspects of the Lord's character are, of course, not contradictory. As it says in Mormon 8.20, For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsel of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. I'm sorry, that was Dr. Cummins 3.4. The Assyrians were only overwhelmingly guilty and ripe for God's vengeance. As it says now in Mormon 8.20, Behold what the scripture saith, Man shall not smite, neither shall he judge, for my judgment is mine, saith the Lord, and vengeance is mine also, and I will repay. God's justice will be meted about those who do not want to repent. If you want mercy, brothers and sisters, in your life, then it is on condition of repentance. If a people, a person, a nation do not want to repent, then they must incur the justices of God upon them and the consequence of that justice. That's what the vengeance of anger of God is. It's his righteous use of justice. 
Nahum was simply justified in announcing those facts. The prophet points out also that the Lord is faithful to those who rely on him, and the darkness shall pursue his enemies, and that darkness shall pursue his enemies. He assures Judah that God will bring utter destruction upon the ancient foe. So as it says, Nahum 1, 2 through 10, the Lord taketh vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. See, the, the punishment comes upon those who do not want to repent. It's not that God likes inflicting punishment. It's that this is what they have chosen instead of mercy. Back to the verse. The Lord is long-suffering and great in power, and will by no means clear the guilty. The Lord in the whirlwind and in the storm is his way, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, maketh it dry. He drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is upheaved at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein, giving an idea of the power of Jehovah. Why would you want to incur the justice of that kind of God? You would think that would compel someone to want to repent and obtain mercy from such a God. Again, nations receive God's vengeance and justice because that's what they have chosen. Individuals will receive punishment and vengeance from God because that's what they have chosen by the use of their agency not to repent. Continuing Nahum 1, 2 through 10, who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? Again, not anger like we have, just meaning in the fierceness of his justice. Mercy cannot rob justice. His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken asunder before him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, if we want him to be. It's up to us, brothers and sisters. And he knoweth them that take refuge in him, but with an overrunning flood. He will make a full end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do you advise against the Lord? He will make a full end. Trouble shall not rise up the second time. For though they be like tangled thorns, and be drunken according to their drink, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry." We can either be protected by the mercy of Jesus Christ, Jehovah, or we can be punished by the justice of him. It is completely up to us. So whenever it talks about God's anger, his wrath, his vengeance, it just means that people have chosen his justice and that punishment and consequences must come. That's all that means. He does not get into an angry rage like we humans do. No, that is not it. Nahum employed imagery usually associated with the Savior's second coming to depict Assyrians' future devastation. Assyria would be as easily burned as dry stubble in a field. Here is yet another example of the prophetic dualism so common in the Old Testament. Thus, this prophecy may be seen as a type of destruction to come upon the wicked nations in the last days. Jehovah is coming to judgment. This coming means a day of terror and darkness for the proposed oppressors, but the lowly believers shall find new hope. So just like Nineveh would not repent again, destruction was coming. His judgment was coming upon the nation. Well, that is a type of the wicked in the latter days. In the last days, those who refuse to repent and who are still wicked, God's judgment and destruction will come upon wicked nations, peoples, kindreds, tongues, and people. So Nineveh becomes a type for the wickedness of the latter days. If you do not want to get caught up in that, then I suggest you get God's mercy through repentance, through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Nahum 1, 11 through 15, a wicked counselor. Still prophesying of Judah's future, Nahum spoke of one very wicked counselor whose yoke upon Judah, probably a large yearly tribute, 
was to be broken. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, had invaded Judah with a force of nearly 200,000 men. The prophecy foretold that Sennacherib would die shortly, and the house of his gods would become his grave. See Nahum 1.14. While he was worshipping in the temple dedicated to the god Nisroch, Sennacherib's two sons, Adramelech and Shahazur, murdered their father as Nahum had prophesied. You can see that in Second Kings 19.37. Judah is called upon to rejoice over her ancient foe, to keep the feast and carry out the vows made in the days of sorrowful oppression while Assyria is condemned. Nahum chapter 2 now, verses 1 through 10, Attack and Conquest of Nineveh. Having prophetically announced the overthrow of the Assyrian power, Nahum proceeds to describe as if truly present the siege and capture of Nineveh. This is done with graphic minuteness and in the most sublime and vivid manner. And so Nahum knows that Assyria will fall and be conquered. And so he goes to describe that as it says, as if truly present. After the death of Ashurbanipal, king of Assyria in 626 BC, Babylon recovered her independence under the Chaldean Nabopolassar. Little is said in the record of this ruler until the year 612 BC, when the vengeance of the oppressed peoples began to assert itself very strongly against Assyria. In that year, Nabopolassar marched north and inflicted a severe defeat on the Assyrians at a place called Kablini. He failed to hold his ground here, as indeed he did again another campaign up the valley of the Tigris. He managed, however, to turn safely to Babylon. Early in the year 614 BC, the Medes also appeared on the scene and captured Ashur while the Chaldean army hastened northward to join them. When junction was made by the two armies, Nabopolassar and Khazersers, if I'm saying that, king of the Medes, made an alliance in the year 612 BC. The combined forces made an assault on Nineveh. The fighting in the suburbs and immediately before the walls was almost desperate, and three terrific engagements took place before the tenses could be stormed. Finally, however, the Allies' superior strength won out, and Nineveh fell. And so Nahum 2, 1 through 10 is Nahum just talking about that fall and these forces coming together to destroy Nineveh. The approach of the hostile army is brilliant, terrible splendor with flashing shields, furious horses, and onrushes of chariots. It is not easy to give a precise explanation of the phrase, the gate of the rivers are opened, but it is clear that the great city is attacked and its inhabitants thrown into confusion. The actual siege was spread over a long period where it is sketched with a few sharp strokes and represented in a few memorable scenes, the carrying away captive of the queen and her maidens and the flight of the people and the spoiling of the city are depicted. Nineveh is like a pool of water, whose waters rush away when the dam is broken down. Thus do the inhabitants of the conquered city flee away. Then all its rich treasures and its magnificent adornments are given to the spoil, and all who had any hope or interest in the doomed city are confounded and put to shame. So again, that's what is talked about in these verses. Nahum chapter 2, 11 through 13, I am against thee. In these verses, Nahum wrote a taunting hymn of grief at the fall of Nineveh, where he asked is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions, verse 11. This is like saying, where are those ferocious ones who once discomforted and attacked my people? I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of the messengers shall no more be heard. Verse 13. So again, you get this taunting hymn. Where are you, Nineveh? Where is your great uh, power like a lion? They have now been cut off. 
Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Woe to the bloody city, the doom of Nineveh. In ancient states, the capital is virtually the kingdom, and to Nineveh here are ascribed all the characteristics of the Assyrian monarchy. The cruelties perpetuated by the Assyrians were shocking. Captive princes who had offered resistance in defense of their country were shut up in cages and exposed to the gaze of the populace. The heads of those already executed were hung around the necks of those still living, and others were filleted alive. The Assyrians appear to have been the most ruthless people of antiquity. So again, there's another description of how brutal the Assyrians were. Verse 1 through 7 pronounced the worst of woes on Nineveh, the bloody city. Verse 1, she was a harlot, wicked in the extreme, and her punishments were merited because she was a mistress of witchcraft that selleth nations through her whoredoms. Verse 4, in other words, she not only turned to wickedness herself, but exported, exported that wickedness to many others through her power and influence. The reason for this doom, the evil influence which this great empire had exerted among the nations. Then, verses 5-7 through seven, follows a vivid de description of the noise of the conflict and the glitter of the paraphernalia of war. Nahum points out that the judgment of the city is well merited. She has acted the part of a harlot, and the harlot's fate she must endure. No one shall have pity upon her or comfort her in her hour of destruction. If Nineveh then is a type of the worldliness today in the latter days, it surely fits. Has not our society and nations acted like harlots, have prostituted themselves, have prostituted their governments for personal gain and to oppress others? Have not our society imported and exported wickedness to its people? You think of the, the wholesale abortion now and government's support of that and funding it. If that is not a nation of a harlot and of witchcrafts, Think of the drug problems we have. Think of the sexual immorality that is rampant within our nations, society, people, governments. Then in the last days, nations too will partake of the same fate that Nineveh did. Destruction will come. That's why these books are important to us, as they describe the destruction of those nations, and those nations are a type of our nations today, then we will face the same destructions that those nations did. And the only escape is righteousness, repentance, and adhering to the ordinance and covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of those who have the opportunity to be members of those who haven't had that opportunity to be as righteous as the knowledge that they have. Verses 8 through 11, Nineveh, the prophet observes, is no better than the Egyptian city of Naaman, Thebes. And her great strength and natural resources will be no more avail. Even as Ashurbanipal had devastated the great Egyptian city, the remnants of whose greatness are described by Dr. James H. Breasted as the mightiest ruins of ancient civilization to be found anywhere in the world, so should Nineveh be despoiled and destroyed. And so will great nations today. Even the U.S. will have to face its judgments for its wickedness, as I said, as it wallows in the bloodshed of unborn children, of gangs, and all kinds of rampant immorality. Verses 12 through 19, Nahum last of all proceeds to describe the city's great fortress as ripe figs ready to be shaken into the mouth of the eater. Her people are weak as women and unable to prevent the entrance of the enemy into the city. 
The siege is near at hand, and preparation should be made for it. But all resistance will be in vain, for the sword will cut off all the inhabitants. There is no healing for the hurt of the city, and all who hear the news about her will clap their hands. Again, if we want to survive, the judgments that will come upon the wicked nations in the last days, including the United States, then your only way out is to turn to God, to Jesus Christ, to repentance, to Him, to the truth, and be faithful in your covenant. Well, what are lessons learned from the book of Nahum? L.S.T. Rasmussen, a great biblical scholar, summarized the lessons of Nahum in these words. The final poem, chapter 3, opens with a prelude on the evils of the oppressive, oppressive city Nineveh. Her lies, rape, and sorcery, her prey in thousands slain, her holotry and witchcraft, and the seduction of nations are all told. Now, if that does not describe today and our society and our nation, I don't know what does. Because of all this, the prophet says she shall become detestable. Verses 5 through 7. Like all others, strong but wicked, Nineveh shall fall. Verses 8 through 11. This in chapter 3. And all her defenses shall be useless when her leaders flee like locusts. Verses 12 through 17. Her end has come. There remains for the prophet but to write the epitaph. Verses 18 through 19. Which is, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. The worthies are at rest. The people are scattered upon the mountains, and there is none to gather them. There is no assurging of thy hurt. The wound is grievous. All that hear the report of thee, clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? So Assyria is finally destroyed. God's judgments have been poured out. And again in the last days they will be poured out upon all nations. Again, including the United States of America. Nahum's message is still true. Decadence ends in destruction. That is why this book is important to us. We live in a very decadent society, a very decadent nation. A nation and government who sanctions death, cruelty, prostitution, child trafficking, abortions, and the like. Although the Lord is slow to anger, he is also great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The wickedness will not last. It will have to come to an end. Hence, mercy shall not rob justice. Neither will justice rob mercy. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. There is the way out. God is good. God is merciful upon the penitent, upon those who keep their covenants in righteousness and by sacrifice. That is who will survive the great and terrible day of the Lord. That is the message Nahum is trying to get across to us. If you do not want the fate of Nineveh, then you must turn to Jehovah, the great God, even Jesus Christ, and come unto him through ordinances and covenants and endure to the end. That, brothers and sisters, is what will give us mercy. If we do not do that, then justice will prevail and destruction will come to societies, to governments, to nations, and to individuals. Well, that's the book of Nahum and the importance of us today. Thank you for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the presentation and please subscribe to the channel.